Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to the 1110 session of day two of Drive. This is the sound room, and we're going to be hearing from um, Carl Halberl about more insight per square foot, leveraging icebergs, horizons, and butterflies. Um, just a couple housekeeping things. All sessions of Drive will be available um, with a video recording on the driveconference.com in March, and all attendees will receive an email letting you know when those videos are available. In addition, you'll notice that you have a survey, and I hope that you've been taking those surveys and turning them in throughout the conference, and I would encourage you to do that with this session as well. So um, Carl Halberl has 18 years of consulting and professional services experiences focused in his efforts on business intelligence delivery, oversight, strategy, research, and BI practice leadership. Prior to joining Logic 2020 in 2012, Carl has led BI practices at Codesic, Codesic Consulting, Microsoft Ascentium Corporation. Um, Carl also teaches the BI, BI certificate program at the University of Washington and authored a visualization patent at Microsoft, is a former founding member of the Northwest chapter of the Data Warehouse Institute, and probably most interesting, co-founded BI Over Beers, a popular monthly local professional meetup. Carl. So I have two microphones. Um, one microphone here I think is for projecting, and the other one is for uh, the video. Um, I actually am pretty used to public speaking, and I also am a little hard of hearing. So if I walk around like this, can you hear me? Is this OK? In the back there, thumbs up, all good? OK. I don't like being tethered to the microphone. Um, how many here have uh, ever heard of Hans Rosling and seen the TED Talk with the bubbles moving around? The guy going like this, you know? If you haven't seen that, definitely take a look at it. I actually uh, I try to fashion my lecture style uh, after him. Um, it is, uh, to me, I, I had a number of educators in, in my professional upbringing uh, that uh, were inspiring to me. And uh, I like that kind of passion. And uh, I'm oftentimes accused of doing lots of arm waving. And so um, I can't necessarily keep my hands in my pockets for the whole time. Before we get started, I actually want to do a quick informal survey. Or, or a poll of the room here, just so I can get a sense of the audience. Um, how many people here consider themselves an executive? One, two, three, four-ish, five-ish, OK. How many people here consider themselves an analyst? OK, over half the room. How many people consider themselves a technician? OK. How many people consider themselves something other than those three? Can I get an example? Most creative example of what you consider yourself in that kind of vein? A fundraiser. A fundraiser, OK. Donor data coordinator. Donor data coordinator, very cool. Yeah. Uh, technical services and support manager. OK, interesting. OK. Uh, so manager kind of paradigm, yeah. There you go. <laughs> so that was my next question. How many people consider themselves a combination of at least uh, two or three of the things that we talked about? Yeah. So BI is, is definitely multidisciplinary. And uh, we find um, I'm a BI practitioner. I know there have been other talks. Um, I sat in on the analytic investment. And there's some talk about business analytics and predictive analytics and business intelligence. Um, I, I use the term business intelligence as this overarching idea. And I really focus on this idea of end-to-end -end BI, um, that essentially if you don't have a way of getting all the way to business insight, which I define as a change in your understanding, then you've actually not succeeded. It's like 95% of a bridge is not a bridge, it's a ramp. Um, and uh, so I really focus on that. I look at business intelligence as that process of turning your data uh, into insight, um, and that it actually um, is somewhat of an insurance policy against bad decision making. The talk today, we're actually going to talk a little bit about some data visualization. Um, I look at data visualization as, uh, um, as the final mile. Um, I think a lot of the failure in business intelligence and in ROI calculations and everything has to do with getting over that last little hump of getting from, wow, we've actually found all these things, and now getting them into the minds of people who can really make decisions um, is really critical. Fortunately, we're in a revolution right now. Uh, the data discovery movement, who's heard of the data discovery movement? Gartner talks about data discovery as a major disruptive one. Um, so Gartner brands it as data discovery. How many people have heard of Tableau software? Okay, so 
Tableau Software is the software define or the software vendor that kind of defines the category. Although there have been other companies that have been in the space for longer, Tibco Spotfire is an example, um, and also. Um, uh, ClickView is also a category definer. And then if you go to the big uh, BI folks, um, everybody's scrambling to have a data discovery method. Um, data discovery is really focused on this idea of using visualization and, and new technology around in-memory data that allow you on your desktop to do things that weren't imaginable ever before. I'm not going to talk about technology today. I'm gonna actually going to talk about the logical constructs that actually can give you higher levels of insight and really focused on being able to give you as much insight as possible, create a much density of insight as possible so that uh, you can actually bridge that gap of that final mile and actually get to the point of being able to uh, change people's understanding. Um, my talk I think is only about a half an hour long if I, if I go through all the slides. So if you have questions well, as we go, I suspect there will be. Um, please interrupt. Um, I'll only spend about a minute or two on any answer uh, during the session, but please do interrupt it. Um, if you're thinking it, someone else is probably thinking it. There are also, in these visualization techniques, um, there's a little bit of preconditioning that has to go on. When you first look at it, you might not like it. Sometimes people, when they look at them, they actually even get nauseous. They're kind of like, you know what, my right brain, my left brain doesn't like the combination. I sat in on the brain conversation. I'm all, <laughs> I'm no expert, but I do experience that where there's this, this sense of, well, the spatial memory and then my cognitive uh, brain, they, they want to talk to each other, but they have a little bit of a challenge to do that. So there's a little preconditioning. You may not see what I'm, what I'm talking about. Please raise your hand because somebody else is not seeing that too and let's talk about it briefly. So I'm going to introduce three uh, innovative uh, visualization techniques. Um, one of them you might have heard before. The other two, I'm almost certain you haven't. Um, Horizons have been out. Stephen Few talks about them. I believe even Edward Tufte talks about them. The uh, iceberg uh, chart is something I invented. Um, it's not that magical, but it's actually really useful. Um, so I'd like to share that with you. And also the butterfly diagrams there. If you go search on the internet, you'll see, find some butterfly diagrams. I'm not talking about the ones you'll find on the internet. I'm actually talking about a new variety of them. Um, and uh, that was actually my patent at Microsoft uh, was around uh, butterfly diagrams. Fortunately, the patent is actually on the use of butterfly diagrams in a software application. So as a practitioner, uh, with the tools we have today, we can use them and we can create them as well. There's also a flaw in the presentation. So if you find the flaw by the end, I would love for, I would love for you to point it out. Um, it's actually something that I didn't have time to fix. Um, it's actually meaningful um, and useful. And if anybody finds it, the first person to raise their hand at the end when I ask, uh, and the, the first person that gets it right, um, I'll take their business card and I'll send them a gift. Maybe. A <laughs> Even better, if someone could help me fix the flaw, that would be even better. I haven't had the time to fix it. So, um, Anybody good at SQL around here? Okay. I'll be looking for some help. Should have been talking on that slide, right? So icebergs, butterflies, and horizons. <clears throat> One of the things I teach at the uh, University of Washington um, Professional and Continuing Education, uh, formerly the UW Extension, um, in the certificate course, I actually teach the middle course for the business uh, track, and the middle course is on data visualization. Um, one of the hard things about uh, visualization is that it's so multivaried and it's hard to categorize and hard to stay focused and tr hard to figure it out. Um, so several years ago, um, again, not perfect but useful, um, I designed this, what I call the chart chart or a visualization guide, which basically goes to a lot of the chart types that you've seen in Excel and other tools um, and kind of categorize them and their relative uses of them. And each of these items, you probably can't read it here. Again, if you, uh, my email's up there. If you're interested in it, I'm happy to send it out to you. Just um, send me an email um, saying I would like a copy of the, um, of the visualization guide. I'm happy to share it with you in words, basically what each one of them are for and kind of a categorization. Kind of look at it almost like a, um, a periodic table of uh, visualizations. The visualizations I'm going to talk about um, are actually in the specialty charts up here. I didn't have a better name for it, so I called them specialty charts. You could also call them compound charts, but I think we actually talked about compound charts up here. So the categorization is imperfect, but again, it's useful. Um, horizon butterflies and icebergs, um, they fit in that spot on the visualization guide. 
<clears throat> so from that guide, we talk about icebergs um, are really useful for demonstrating the relative change over time without losing absolute scale. Anybody know what that means? So the story behind it is actually, um, I was tracking some stocks on my iPhone. And every time I would look at the stock, I look at it on a one month increment, then I look at a three month increment, and then I look at it at a six month increment, because I want to see kind of where it's at. And on the iPhone, it actually had a maximum and minimum value. And that maximum and minimum value um, uh, always changed depending on the time horizon. And so I would lose my anchoring to the ideas of the absolute scale of how these things are moving, because I only see the rel relative scale as we move between those time horizons. I said there must be a better way. <clears throat> so to describe this, here's a standard line chart. Um, who can guess what this data represents? Set. <laughs> you kind of have the, you know, a lot of false starts and eventually you take off. That's a good, good guess. Anyone else? It's made up. Sorry. It's just useful for demonstrating the purpose. The other thing is, is that what we, re what we also experience a lot, and somebody was talking to me the other day about Insight uh, or BI on your mobile device, and I was saying, oh, it's great on a tablet because it's big enough you can actually see things. They said, no, I want it on my mobile phone. And I said, you know, if you need it on your mobile phone, um, you're probably not dealing with something that's strategic enough to actually spend the time to get that kind of insight. Um, I would actually prefer my mobile phone to give me alerts when I need to do something that's kind of more insight oriented, but I need to have something that's a little bit bigger. And here's the problem, right, is that as we, as we change the different form factors and move our phones different ways, we end up uh, getting all kinds of distortion. <clears throat> In my view, you can take that one and bring it down to here and you get kind of the same idea. Now there's a general rule of thumb is you want to keep your charts in, uh, in general about as square as possible. I actually make the argument that we've actually been preconditioned as a population to handle kind of the aspect ratio of three to five. Started with the three by five note cards in third grade when you wrote your first thesis, remember that? And then we moved to it and all the screens that we have have approximately that kind of a, a ratio, a three by five type ratio. So I like to keep that kind of ratio, ratio proportion um, as we go. The other thing is, as we shrink it down to a, a smaller size, uh, we generally want to make sure that we maximize the space, right? Because you know, we're if we're moving to all these different mobile devices and things like that. And actually, if I want to put mo small multiples, Tufty talks about this. Stephen Few talks about this. This idea of um, well, if I could actually get insight for one thing and then dimensionalize it out and see five different versions of it for different combinations of dimensions that matter to me, I want to shrink them down. Well, if I shrink them down, I also want to maximize the space. So this is the problem that you see on your iPhone, is that you'll actually see a chart that looks like this. Or your Android phone, is anybody here from, uh, Am or from uh, Google or okay. Microsoft? Um, but essentially what it does is it actually sets the, the height at the, at the highest value and the, the bottom at the lowest value. And that's all fine and good if you're looking at a single view, you get a sense of it. But you actually lost the absolute scale. This is the real absolute scale of how that moves. And this one, it shrinks it down. I actually see the, the, the pattern really well. But I've lost the sense of the scale that, that I'm actually only looking at the data from here to here. Make sense? We want more insight per square inch or square foot. Um, and we also oftentimes will deal with things at different scales. This one, you can see the maximum value is 500. This one, the maximum value is 800. However, if I go in and do the same technique there and actually create a small chart to the far right um, that tells me the extent of it, I can actually maintain both the absolute scale and the relative scale. So where's the iceberg? The icebergs are sit right here. The idea is that much of what you have is below the surface. And when you do these kinds of visualizations, you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. That's it for icebergs. Except for we want small multiples. Sometimes we want to look at a bunch of different things. Here you can see things at scales of 116, 799, 700, 455, and they're all set up. And you get some insight on that at that scale. But what if there was something really meaningful um, when you wanted to rationalize those scales and you, you might have lost some of the values? So all I did in this, the difference between these two is actually move them all to the same common scale of 800. If I switch them to iceberg charts, 
which is both a combination of a line chart or an area chart or a bar chart, and also show the extent, um, I can actually see all the variation. That variation can be really useful, especially when it's calibrated and correlated with other things that might be of the same, uh, against the same kinds of uh, categories, whether it be time or other, thing, other categories that you may have um, on the x-axis. Yes? No. Right. So you'll notice that this is at 108 to 116. This bar right here is actually representing 108 to 116 on the scale of 800. They all have 800 here because the maximum value of all the charts is 800. So what it's really showing you is the relative variation that you have for each of those charts. Um, that's right. You can sort it by scale, sorting over there, and you can now get some insight as a result of that. Um, and ultimately, what we're doing here is we're giving ourselves more insight per square inch. I actually can see this variation without losing everything else, and I get a highlighted view, for example, of one chart if I actually create this uh, combination of them. And if I'm a little bit more clever, I can actually save quite a bit of space. And here's a design variation on it, slightly different version of it, maybe a little prettier uh, for those of you that want to put something together that um, might be more intuitive. Yes? Have yes. included stock in any software packages? Or where nope. Um, no, and none of these are stock, and uh, that's not entirely true. The Horizons are actually stock, I think, on Panopticon, um, a very specialized visualization piece of software. Um, they actually can be developed, these I did all in Excel. Um, they can be developed in reporting services and in, in Tableau. I've done them in all three of those rel relatively easily. Um, the, uh, one of the tricks in visualization, someone once said that visualization is 99% data prep and 1% presentation. Um, and so uh, there are SQL snippets that can actually generate these from any data set. Um, I have them for some of them, not for all of them. Um, it's something I will be developing and, and sharing at some point if folks are interested. Yes? The iceberg? That, I mean, that's the iceberg chart. This is the line chart, right? This is the iceberg chart that accompanies it. Because on the smaller, on the smaller scale, the smaller chart, you yep. have your scale on the left. Yep. The scale doesn't apply to the iceberg. So this, these scales actually are represented twice. So B is B over here in this artist rendering. So that's extent here. I made them all gray here so that you can basically, if you swap these out, like if we had something that said, oh, I want to click on that one, that one would pop up there, this one would pop back down there, and it would, be, it would be the green one here and the other ones would be represented in gray. And I've actually put them, there's something really useful about putting them right next to the chart, but there's also something really useful about putting them comparatively to each other. You don't, this is one artist rendering. This is another one where it's just these, it's just these four here. You just don't have it right next to the chart. Uh, the challenge with this is that not everybody can do the color matching, so we also have letter matching to be able to help people do that. And we've sorted it intentionally from left to right so that you see the biggest. And you can do it from the highest value from left to right, or you can do it from the largest extent from left to right. These are all things that you have to precondition people to read. But when I want to put a lot of data on a page and you get somebody preconditioned to that, you can actually get a ton of data on a page and actually see them and really and see it all in, in kind of one mind's eye. Here's another example. This is actually an example of a mock-up I've done for a client. This is the range here of 435 to 495. Here's the iceberg. This is a case of not bringing them all together, but this is a case of essentially um, showing the range. This is the variation, and the variation is very subtle but very important. And this is the data that goes behind it. It was actually about forecasting and generating forecasting accuracy at different intervals. But the iceberg chart actually reminds you of what your absolute scale is against your relative scale. Butterflies. Sir. Quick question back on the iceberg. Do you ever have situations where you have both the vertical and the horizontal um, changing so that the, the x axis? You certainly could. I haven't explored that. Um, 
So one of the things that we generally do with visualizations is, is because there's a lot of preconditioning that goes on, you have to be aware of your audience's ability to go to certain levels of abstraction. My guess is that while I could probably do it because I do this all the time, a lot of people actually, especially decision makers and executives, would be less likely to want to go through the mental work of actually getting their brain wrapped around that kind of a paradigm. Um, however, it's kind of an excellent question, and you know the difference between an excellent question and a good question? You got it. It leads to the next topic. Um, so butterfly diagrams actually have a little bit more of that horizontal and vertical variation. Um, and uh, we'll get onto that one next. So um, butterflies highlight significant exceptions to general patterns. Put another way, I actually sometimes uh, talk about this. It scares some people, but I call it visual calculus. It allows me to look at the, the instantaneous variations of two ranges of data in a visual way that if I can precondition people to see them, they can actually see things without any math, which is really useful, especially with executives who don't have a lot of time to get into the math and to trust the data uh, that comes from the math. So we start with the basic three by three uh, heat map. Um, this is random data pulled out of AdventureWorks 2012, the sample database that you know comes with Microsoft SQL Server. And here's a basic heat map. Don't know if the colors come out that well. They're, oh, they're okay. You can see some of the variation. You can see, um, you know, that's obviously the dominant one. The major problem with this, and this is something I actually threatened to have a T-shirt made that says, "Well, you'll see it in a minute." But I don't believe. Let's see if it. Uh, I don't believe uh, in ever, in an analytic environment, ever sorting anything alphabetically. Alphabetical sorting has no analytic value. It has good lookup value, but guess what? Most software tools have the ability to do a control F, and most dimension where you can actually go and find the value you're looking for, and most people don't want to start with Alaska on everything, right? It's usually not the thing that drives uh, most of the insight, if you're talking about a state, for example. <clears throat> so if I were to actually take those columns and make a basic histogram, you can see that, okay, that's the, that's the grand total for all the columns. That's the grand total for all the rows. Obviously, we can see some uh, asymmetry here and some, you know, they're alphabetical, so we see the variation by alphabet, which is not very analytically valuable. And so it's really hard to see the insight when you do something like that, right? I mean, it's like, okay, you're just basically telling me the same thing multiple ways. Nothing real valuable there. This is my soapbox. Uh-uh. <laughs> We're not going to sort things alphabetically. We're going to start to sort them by some value. Yes, sir? I just want to say that there is some value in the alphabet, though, because then when you look at a series of diagrams, you can find things in repeatable places. I, I don't disagree with that particular option, but there are also better ways to do that from a standpoint of if you, if you get to the idea of highlighting, like if you find one and highlight it and have it highlight all the same values in that, or a lot of the tools now have brushing techniques where I have one visualization and I find the one that I want and I highlight it. By highlighting that one, it filters all the others or highlights all the others for that same value. So we have a lot of tools that actually solve for that problem and they still give you the analytic value, again, with that cross-referencing that you're looking for. So our tools have actually enhanced so much that it actually is useful to do it that way as opposed to sorting it alphabetically. So this is a butterfly diagram. It's a really simple one. The idea is that we basically took those histograms that were kind of sort of descending by the value, attached them upside down and to the left um, on the rows and columns, and then sorted them. And now we can actually see that the combination of the largest value and the largest value puts it in the upper left-hand corner. Generally speaking, you look for that pattern, right? Is that if I put the largest at the top and the largest to the left, then hopefully the largest member will be in the upper left-hand corner. That's not always the case. Well, it always is the case actually for the very up, up leftmost, upper leftmost item. But the ones around it, there's some variations in it uh, that uh, um, become very interesting. So let's look for the insight. 
One of the things that we do with butterfly diagrams, and this is again a very simple case of a butterfly diagram, is you're going to start removing those outliers. It actually, it's no duh that the first one is going to be the darkest one, so now let's go down the line. I did this all in Excel, and I've done this with conditional formatting. So there's a really neat technique in Excel that you can highlight any cell and say, remove the conditional formatting from that. It removes it from the set, and it basically recalibrates your conditional formatting for the heat map to all the other values. So you start to, you're actually kind of like, consider it almost like uh, lowering the water line or raising the water line, lowering the water line, and you'll see in the next levels um, as you go. When I go further, I start to see, and can you see that variation on the screen? That was the hard, you can see a little bit of that variation. This is a case where if this was, if this held, if the pattern held, as you went down this way, you'd always be going from darker to lighter. Well, in this particular case, we have a lighter one that's both ahead, up above and to the left of darker ones. Um, and then the progression continues. And then we have another variation here as well. So you start to see these variations. Those outliers are really interesting. And those are the ones you generally want to drill in. Again, it's a real simple example. But you can do this with really large sets of data. You can start to find these outliers that actually tell you something about the nature of your data. And as we go further, that becomes more obvious. Now, I did this in Excel. We were talking about software tools. This is in Excel, and I originally did this with a percentage of variation. This is a kind of a, a loose histogram. Um, I had to do it manually because there's no tools for doing the histogram against the colors in conditional formatting in Excel. If you do it in reporting services or other tools, um, you could actually have that automatically generated. Those are all the members that meet in those ranges by the percent. Now, when we do it by percent, basically it says, let's break everything up into even-sized buckets and see where they fall. So it's a histogram of all those members, all those squares over there. There's a variation, and I haven't quite decoded the algorithm, but you can move it to percentile. The idea behind percentile is, let's put it into an even number of buckets and try to evenly distribute it. So I went to go do that, and unfortunately, I would have expected this histogram to be exactly even. And it's the mysteries behind the percentile on the midpoint in conditional formatting. It doesn't quite work that well. Um, and by the time I got to that point, I'm like, I'm not going to do this all over in a tool that allows me to do this exactly right. So that is a flaw, but that's not the flaw that I was talking about. <clears throat> do you see the distribution, how it's a little bit different? This is actually the variation in that value from that value. It's that big, and then the variation shrinks. This was supposed to be somewhat even. Essentially, what they were saying is the mid, basically centering around the midpoint, and there's a lot of values that are in there. It shows a little bit more variation. Yes? Carl, when you take off the conditional formatting on the top left, that yes. because you know it's going to be the highest score. Yep. Yes. To almost make that a sliding scale? Not in this tool, um, but in any other uh, tool that actually separates the data from the formatting. So reporting services, absolutely. There's no, it's really easy to be able to do that. Again, it's in the data prep, so it's about sending a parameter to your store procedure that would actually filter by that. But it's actually, mathematically, it's very easy to do. Um, Tableau would actually also allow you to do that uh, with a little less SQL. So the idea is, is that for the same, you know, this is one piece of insight. And what we really see here is, okay, I can find the lightest value and the darkest value, but that's about it. Whereas here, I can actually start to find not only that combination, but any variations in those patterns. And as I filter it down, I get more, more insight uh, per square inch. Where's the butterfly, you may ask? Anybody see where the butterfly is? Does it make sense? Why is it called a butterfly? Well, there's two reasons why we call it a butterfly. I use a lot of cooking metaphors in, uh, in insight generation because it's very similar. You basically take something, put it through a transformation process, and then change someone's brain chemistry or their body chemistry by feeding them the insight or the food. Right? Butterflying uh, in, uh, in cooking is when you take something that's a multidimensional and you cut it down the middle and you spread it open so that it can be exposed to the heat and creates more flavor. So it's a good metaphor for that. It's also um, kind of rudimentarily, here's the thorax. And there's your butterfly. <laughs> here's another example. I got hundreds of these examples, but a lot of them actually have uh, um, 
kind of proprietary or sensitive information on them, so it's kind of hard for me to pick through them. But this is an example of actually a multi-tiered butterfly where I did something uh, where I was doing, uh, um, this is a work breakdown structure on all the categories of, of, at the high level categories of what you do in BI. These people across the top in the same exact order are all the people in my practice or as of several months ago. And through a survey, I determined where their experience was at, on a scale of, on a total points of 100, their interest level, and where the deltas were from their experience to their, um, to their interest. And it gives me an idea uh, of being able uh, to uh, kind of develop strategies around leveraging people's interest, filling in gaps, providing training, um, and then actually testing that against what's uh, valued and desired in the marketplace um, as I move my practice forward. They're sorted down at the bottom by relative seniority and tenure. So these two people, um, it was by a somewhat arbitrary scale that I kind of adjusted because I wanted to get to the point where it created meaning. So I sorted all those people, not by the totals in here because they all sum up to 100, but I sorted by their relative seniority and tenure and, and kept that constant across those and the differences are things that I can see. Now again, I can read a lot in here. I wouldn't expect you to because you've just been introduced to the concept. What do I read in here? So these colors are actually another piece of uh, a combination that are kind of relatively interesting. Um, these are more business-centric uh, um, work breakdown structure areas, and these are more technical. So one of the things that I noticed is that um, you know, our experience level, so this is the total of all the experience. My experience level is really high on the data management side and, um, on the, um, uh, and also over here on the ETL side, which is some of the more technical stuff. That's where people's experience has been. But their interest was driving not only to data management, but the next thing is to the disruptive technology, uh, things that are new in the marketplace. A lot more interest over here. And this is sort of descending by interest, actually. The green is what it's sort of descending by in the blue. And I could vary those if I was trying to focus on various things like that. Does that help? So Horizons, I told you this would be a quick tour. <laughs> How many people have seen Horizons before? One, two, gal in the back was in my class, so. <laughs> I'll refund your money for this yeah, session. <laughs> So we take a standard area chart, and we band it, essentially saying, well, that's all well and good, but we, we want to keep the three by five uh, to keep it the least amount of distortion. If I shrink it down to be able to look at it smaller, I lose uh, some of that. So if I, want to, um, if I actually want to see the variation in that, I just create natural bands across that data just by cutting it into even pieces. I could do it in four bands, I could do it in six bands, you could even do it in 100 bands if you wanted. A little bit overkill, uh, you probably wouldn't see anything, but you know, somewhere in the area of four to six bands, depending on how much variation you have. If you take those bands and stagger them, think of it as if the data was the, all that uh, light version of the blue, you cut them all in, in, in the slices, and then you stacked them in front of each other. The beauty of this is that the highest areas sit in the front, and then the lower areas sit behind it. If you do it right, essentially what this is is like taking those mountains, chopping them all down, and looking at them as if they were almost like translucent glass. If, every, if each one of those bands were exactly the same color over here, you can see that there's a lot more density here of those stacks that go to the height. Right here's the highest areas are right there. When you decompose, one of the things that's really valuable, again, we talk about small multiples, this idea if I can get things small, then I can actually look at multiple copies of that. That's the summary across the top. This is now broken out, not alphabetically, <laughs> but broken out actually by the total here, descending. So I borrowed a butterfly wing, a part of a butterfly wing on the histogram on there, sorted it that way. And I can now see the US, uh, Canada, um, Australia, Great Britain, France, and Germany. Everybody see it? Useful? So again, we get more insight per square inch. Not only do I have the same variation here as here, and I can see it, but I can also get all this detail in the same amount of space. Um, if you want other examples, 
Um, this deck will be available, I believe, and if it's not, send me an email and I'm happy to send you a copy of this, this deck. Um, there's a lot of examples of that. I think this one was actually done in Tableau. I don't believe they shared the, uh, the sequel for it, and the prep is a little bit tricky. Um, I do have the sequel uh, for um, the ones that I did before, as far as prepping the, any data set to be able to band it and put it into those uh, different categories. But this is actually pretty cool. When you click on it, it allows you to look at, um, you can sort it in a number of different ways. Um, I believe they actually have this sorted like by the total, the average of the value, uh, descending or ascending, and so you get kind of the general trends and then you can see the detailed ones. There's a lot of good examples. If you just look at horizon charts, uh, you Google search or Bing search it, you can find it. So in summary, we have icebergs, butterflies, and horizons. We do actually get more insight per square inch, which is very useful for being able to present uh, more detailed uh, information to folks. That's all I have. Any questions? Just go back to that last horizon slide for a second. Um, that one? Yeah. So, so that, well, I guess it was slide before that you just had the. This one? No. Back to you. One more. There we go. That, that one on top, right? Yeah. There's no key to that, right? Right. You mean scale? No, like with the colors, wait, I see, I see, like above uh, 2801, I see a dark blue key, but I have no idea what, well, but yeah, there's no scale, and there's no, I don't know what, is that US, is that California, like, so I that one, no so idea what, what, what I'm looking at, I, I, uh, yeah, there is, yeah. Um, generally speaking, you'd actually need to explain what that value actually was, right? In good presentation of data visualization, that's appropriate. All I'm trying to do is highlight the fact that that's the total of all of these here. This band across the top is all of these combined together. That doesn't, in this example, I'm actually, the, again, the data is relatively random and not very meaningful um, for, this, for the purposes of this presentation because I'm trying to keep it as generic as possible. You apply whatever you know, what maybe if from a standpoint, I'm not a uh, um, advancement uh, development professional. So I, you know, I'm learning a lot actually about at this, pra or at this conference on that. But you could have anything on here from a standpoint of what are the overall donations over time by these different regions or these different donor categories. And that could be the total across the top. Two thousand eight hundred one, right here, just the, the there, peak there. Right? there. And then behind them is a uh, plateaued. Yes. Mountain. Yes. It different below. I, yes. So you found the so flaw. Okay. <laughs> you found the flaw. So a perfect. Should that be the darkest one in front? Yeah. Yes, you're absolutely right. It should actually be. There actually is a little bit of darkness right here, but it actually fits a little bit. The the fit is a little wonky, and that's because I did this in Excel. Um, and Excel does not have the ability for me to line those things just perfectly the way that I wanted to be able to do that. Um, so essentially, the data needs to be designed in such a way that in the, in the class, and this is what you'll see, there's actually some distortion in this example. And like I said, I've written the SQL to be able to do the banding, but there's an imperfect, there should be a plateau right here. See, and it actually has spiked and spiked because the values are on the, on the item right here. So these should be cut. And I ran out of time to figure it out. You found the flaw. <laughs> if, you're SQL, if, if you're a SQL expert, I can send you the SQL, and I'd love to get that. I actually provided that opportunity for my class, and nobody um, has figured it out. We have some really smart SQL guys, but um, it's a tricky thing because what you have to do with the SQL, if you're writing it in SQL, is to reference the one ahead of it and the one behind it, and then actually change the value to go down um, to the band instead of actually be at the spike that would be at the cutoff point. Uh, it's a little bit more tricky because it's a row-based calculation as well as a, um, as well as a column-based calculation. You should post it on the again. I should. That's a good idea. <laughs> you found the flaw. Send me your email. I'll, I'll send you a gift. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So with, can you go to the next slide, the one with the detail, more detailed view? Yeah. So how do you teach people to read this chart? I mean, what do you look for when you're when you've got your data mapped up this way? Where do you where do you get the insights out of this chart? It's a good question. So one of the things that you would expect here 
is that you want to figure out when you have spikes, and again, once you apply your meaningful data, um, it, you'll actually, it becomes easier to see the insights, right? But let's just say for the sake of argument, we say, oh, we've got these dark areas here. Dark area here, dark area here. Which ones are contributing most to that? Is it the big one? Is this one just consistently uh, contributing to all the big ones? Or are there other cases where at these smaller, you know, at these smaller categories, are they contributing to that height? Uh, or are there blue cases, like here is a blue case, that none of these actually are contributing, but that one is actually contributing to that value, right? So you're looking for cases where down at the details, you have these anomalies where, oh, this, you know, maybe the smallest total is contributing unusually uh, to one of the spikes up there, and that actually gives you that variation where you can say what happened there. When you find out what happened there, it may in fact be, well, they had actually a really effective campaign <laughs> in this particular area. And so we want to go and actually research that and say, what did they do there? Because boy, if they did that, was it a function of time or was it just a function of, um, boy, they just did a huge spike up here and we want to replicate that in other places or at least experiment with that. Um, the idea behind business intelligence is that we don't give you all the answers, we just give you better questions, the ability to ask better questions. And so that's the idea is when you find those. It's also entirely possible you find nothing, right? But you might also decompose this by a different dimension then, right? Or you might actually rationalize it against maybe the population size or the customer size or whatever because the U.S. has a larger population than Canada. So you may in fact decide, okay, I'm going to rationalize this now to population size and see if that has some variation. But it allows you to ask the next level of question. Analysis is essentially taking a whole, breaking it down into meaningful uh, pieces, analyzing and looking at the, um, the variations in those pieces, and then taking that knowledge and extrapolating it back to the whole. That's what this allows you to do. Yes? the grand total. <coughs> it's the grand total. It, this is a simple example. You can pick whatever you want. And in butterfly diagrams, I didn't really demonstrate that, but we have a pattern that we generally use, um, is that at the very basic, and this is what I showed you as a very basic one, we abstract out butterfly diagrams like this. Essentially, this being representative of the hist descending histogram. And so there are these five different areas here. The beauty of this is that when you start out, you have basically three dimensions, and this is a summation of the three. This is the sum of the rows, and this is, or maybe the average, depending on what the value is, and maybe, maybe if these are averages, you don't, want to aver you don't want to sum them, you want to average them, but some aggregation calculation there. As you get more sophisticated, and you saw that on my second example, I actually do patterns that look like this. One, two, or three, four, and five where I actually bring in other dimensions that matter to me. For example, I might have revenue in here, but I might have profitability here. Or I might have profitability here and revenue here. And I might find that my profitable people are all in the smaller revenue sections, right? And that kind of variation in the pattern is really useful. Likewise, we oftentimes will do these for scorecards. We'll take them further to a scorecard. And when I see a scorecard that looks like this, what do I do? I stop everything. If this is the, the largest scale and this is the highest priority and I'm doing really poorly here, I really emphasize it. On the other hand, if my scorecard looks something like this, I don't have to feel so bad, right? These are perhaps the smaller things that are not doing so well. It's a portfolio. Not all KPIs are created equal. And you actually can then say, well, let's go down the, let's find the next area where we need to go and, um, as we move down. And you're actually able to kind of calibrate your scorecard on multiple dimensions. I think we have uh, time for one more question, if anybody has any questions. I'm available to talk afterwards. I have business cards. Uh, send me an email if you'd like to see copies of this. I believe it'll be on, uh, on the site in a couple of weeks. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you.